As I told you last time, I'm not going to need to look at a test until we finish Josephus about it. And I don't should be hard to make it halfway through the term that we get there. So you can gauge where we are. You can gauge where we are. You can gauge where we are by how close we are. We're going to read in the Penguin Josephus about the first 160 pages up to the beginning of the war against Rome. There is no need to really read the War Against Rome as such, although, uh, like I told you, it, you could do it, because, it, it, you know, it's, it's a very detailed, a little bit boring, and, I mean, I enjoy reading it, not for the misery that one reads there, but uh, because there's so, much little, so many little points that later come, in, come into play, but, you know, you couldn't really pick up those points until you really got a a real uh, heavy-duty feel for this period, so there's no need to read that section at the moment. But all the way up to that section, you can, be reading. you can read ahead as well. Now, I cover a lot of that material in the Maccabees Zadokites essay. Uh, at least my uh, my uh, approach or take on Maccabees Zadokites, Christians and from Rome, which is in that Xerox uh, packet I put down in the bookstore or in the Dead Sea Scrolls of the First Christians, whichever one you might have. But I really want to know what I'm going to say about that or what I know about that. That essay basically uh, has everything in there that I'm ever going to say about the first part of this class up to Josephus. So you might want to look at that. As far as work goes, I'm not interested that you kill yourself, as I told you, right? I want you to keep ahead and say, well, what else should I be doing? Well, you could be reading uh, sort of the biblical book, which you probably already finished, the, the Josephus material, that essay. Uh, anything else that comes to your mind that would be you would be interested in? I'm more interested in learning uh, a, a little well rather than a lot badly. So uh, I, I really don't care if you work hard or not. I'm not interested in killing people. I don't think work necessarily makes uh, makes people smart. And uh, insight does. And uh, all work and no play makes whatever it is, John or Jill, a good girl or a dull or boy or girl. And um, everything piles up at the end anyway. So you can coast a bit now, and later on it'll start to uh, pick up. So as far as the paper goes, which is uh, the other thing we've uh, neglected to discuss, you know, I usually require a five to 10 page paper, but as far as I'm concerned, you can, um, um, there you go. Uh, any questions before we start off? Problems? Okay, I'll give you ample warning for the midterm. Uh, Faster we go. I hope we can finish the Maccabee book tonight, but I'm sure that we won't be able to. I'd like to, but I don't think we'll be able to. So we were talking about the parallelness of Maccabees and uh, Dan. And I showed you at the beginning of 1 Maccabees that these guys start their book in 1 Maccabees at exactly the same place that uh, Daniel basically starts all his visions. A little earlier that he goes back to Persia and Babylon and stuff, but on the whole, it, the big visions are always Alexander the Great, it starts with Alexander the Great. And that's what made the big impression on, on these people. I'm sure that earlier time, the other things made a big impression, but in this time, that's what made the big impression. But, um, There was also another problem that was engendered by Alexander's coming. And there, by the way, as I told you, there are going to be several books, this, uh, several movies this fall on Alexander. So you'll have a, a bit of a belly full of Alexander. I won't tell you anything much about what we're doing, but it'll give you an idea if you don't know much about him. Uh, something of what he did, given the Hollywood take on it. I mean, I think I told you I saw Brad Pitt in Troy or whatever it was. <coughs> And if that, if that was so bad, and that had nothing, that was nothing like Homer's Troy, and nothing like any Iliad I ever read. So if that's their take on it, it's hopeless. 
And I'm sure the same thing for King Arthur, with the woman with the bow and arrow, who's supposed to be Guinevere. <laughs> She's a huntress or something. Come on, give me a break. Or as woman's lip slant on it, but I'm sure it uh, has no reality in time at all. So, um, I don't know how good these Alexander movies are going to be, but they're going to come on and you'll have some uh, opportunity to see them. But the other thing connected to Alexander that's important is Hellenization. Uh, Hellenization uh, was a process begun after the uh, coming or conquest or appearance of Alexander. And uh, it, 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 it entailed um, the imposition of a kind of Greek civilization on these native populations. Alexander, at the end of his activities, uh, insisted that his officers, I'm not sure if it was divorce their wives or whatever, or just take another one, but I think would divorce their wives and take on a, a local wife from the local areas, a so-called oriental wife. And uh, in order to mix the populations and get a, a, a cosmopolitan new sort of uh, ethos and culture going. You know, Iraq was one of the main places he hung out in. And if he was trying to get something going there, he sure failed. So, uh, I mean, it didn't seem to, whatever he got stirred up there, it didn't last very long. Uh, but in any event, um, his idea was this kind of homogenization. And it, I think most people everywhere were happy with it, except in Palestine, or Judea, whatever you want to call this area. They were not happy with it. And you know, they were very stubborn, which is why the Jews have had a lot of problems over time. Because other nations, outside nations, conquering nations, even Christianity, Paul and people like that, were just uh, um, not ready for the obstinacy and the um, tenacity with which these people hung on to their cultural heritage and um, traditions. Uh, I mean, if you read the stuff yourself, you'll, you'll, you can see why. They, they thought it was God-given. And they thought the laws and things that they were involved in were God-given. And, uh, you know, to abandon these things or to go back on them, I mean, they didn't feel they had the warrant to do that. I'm sure a lot of them would have liked to, uh, even up to today. I mean, it's still going on today. This is like two, three thousand years later. There's lots of Jews around. Not a lot. They, uh, Hitler managed to you know, cut them in half, unfortunately, in a pretty uh, vicious uh, manner. But uh, there's still Jews around, and they still undergo the same problem. Half of their children don't want to practice these things. Three quarters, I would say. Uh, because they're so heavy, they're so heavy, they're so onerous and so on. The, because uh, why are they so onerous? The legal requirements put upon them by themselves or their God as the Sinai covenant is presented as being. Why, why are they so onerous? Well, the theory behind it was that they were supposed to be a holy people among the nations. Well, it's a pretty, I don't mean stupid, it's a very noble uh, ambition. And it's very uh, elegant, and uh, if you're a poet, poetically minded person, it's a very uh, inspiring and um, attractive concept. But in those days, priests had special uh, purity regulations laid upon them, cleanliness regulations, regulations in their treatment of sexuality, of uh, sexual relations, of uh, of uh, dead bodies, of pollution, of coming in contact with impure people, and stuff like that. Because these people were supposedly in service at the altar in these cultures. It's not just Jews have this. All ancient civilizations had this. We've abandoned it. Paul is kind of like the forerunner of the abandonment. He's like the, if you like, the first person in this context who sort of wanted to be a cosmopolitan. And uh, he even goes so far as I told you, in the, well, not him, but the presentation of Jesus in the scripture, which I don't, I do know, uh, can think is very historic. Uh, Jesus <coughs> recommends, because he's adopting the, the Paul position that um, uh, all foods are clean. And Paul uh, argues that in 1 Corinthians. And 
And Jesus is presenting as talking about uh, that which goes into the mouth, going through the body and out the toilet bowl, and I've told you about this, but that which comes out of the mouth is what renders a man or a woman unclear to our noble thought. Um, but in the process of doing that, he goes so, so far, or the writers of that material go so far to have Jesus say that there's no need to uh, uh, wash your hands before eating. You know, which was a, they just said, oh, that's just a Jewish superstition. That's just Jewish scrupulousness. That's from, you know, the, the law. But even if we're Christian today, you got to do a double take when there's Jesus saying, don't wash your hands before eating. <laughs> and you realize you're not in an historical situation of the historical God, man, Christ. You're in a polemical debate between people who didn't want to keep purity regulations and those people who did. And there's nothing to do with the struggle of Jesus whatsoever. It has to do with arguments between these groups. Because uh, my Christ, your Christ, anyone's Christ is not going to say, don't wash your hands before eating. And I wouldn't even hang that on poor Jesus. I wouldn't even, and you can argue it away. You can make excuses. You can try to find a way up around it. But it says it clearly in two Gospels. You know, blames the Pharisees for this. They're his favorite whipping boy. And uh, he says, you know, you know, they like to wash their hands, but you, there's no need to. You should honor your ancestors. Basically implying, if you're, <laughs> this is a crazy argument, if your ancestors didn't wash your, their hands, you shouldn't either. That's what the argument says. You, you, you'll read the argument, you'll see, because they said, oh, there's a higher law. Honor your ancestors. It's in the, it's in, he even says, this is a, uh, in this discussion in uh, Mark and Matthew, he says, this is a tradition of the, of the elders, of the fathers, that's washing your hands before eating. But God's law says, honor your, honor, your, honor your father and mother. Therefore, you're dishonoring your father and mother if you don't do what they did. That is, since they didn't wash their hands in most uh, non-Jewish environments or non-priestly environments, you, should, you don't have to either. Okay, well, you know, that's, uh, he knows that these kinds of regulations, the traditions of the elders was a part of the Talmudic literature. So um, he, or the people writing that, are attacking the materials about the law that come down in the Talmudic uh, tradition. And the Talmud is a document you may or may not know that really was not put into writing until the second century. CE or AD, or whatever you want to call it. And it took four centuries basically to collect all the stuff. So it was being written down in different parts up to the sixth or seventh century. It's really similar to the church fathers who were putting down all the stuff for Christianity from around the second <coughs> century to the fourth or fifth century. So they're basically two sides of the same book. But this thing in the Gospels is attacking something in the town that we are familiar with if you if you read the Talmud. He said, well, Professor Eisman, you're saying all these things, but why don't other people say any of these things? Well, if you expect the average believer to know these kind of technical questions, it's impossibility. I mean, the average believer is not in the religious heritage for, um, for uh, historical reasons. They're in there for the inspiration and the communal solidarity that it gives them. So you can't expect the average person you can start to talk about this with the average believer. You expect them to understand what you're talking about. I think that um, it's uh, unfortunately almost an impossible expectation. Anyway, um, so this is Hellenization. And um, that's why I got on this topic. Because to think that in addition to Alexander, you have these priestly peoples, the Jews said they, or were, had the, uh, uh, the um, pretense that they were a holy people. Why? Because they said God had, had a, 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 a singled us out as a nation of priests, that we will minister unto the nations. We will be the priests and so on and so forth. It's a ridiculous conceit. But that's how they justify the law of Moses to themselves and the harsh requirements. So if you go to India, how many have been to India? You know that they have a Brahmin class, and it's a priest class. The Persians have a Maji class. 
These people have huge, you know, they used to anyway, they don't need more, have huge purity regulations. And, uh, you know, the, the Brahmins in India are really, uh, you know, overloaded with regulations. It's just like the old Hebrews. But they didn't lay it on the whole nation. You know, in, in India you have a caste system. You have the Brahmins on the top and Persia the same thing. But you didn't have this democrat democratization that the whole people would be a holy people. Just the priests. And that's why you have these onerous like regulations among the Jews. You say, well, why don't the Jews get out from under it? Well, there's no way they can get out from under it. Because that's what the religion is. That's what the Mosaic heritage is. You abandon your ancestors or whatever your culture. There's just no way out. I mean, I could, uh, you know, argue till I'm blue in the face, but the next generation is the same with problem that's going to happen. So, um, in any case, you also have to understand why, how obdurate they were. Because these were God-given, there's no way that they can abandon them. I mean, take someone like myself. I am a big tray food eater, as they call it. Shrimp, lobster, whatever, you name it. I don't, I'm not crazy about pork. But I got, like, a, you know, I got a, a kind of thing in my head about you're not supposed to eat it, but if it's given me, I'll eat it. And uh, I quite like the taste of it. There's nothing, nothing wrong. I'm not going to kill myself over it. But uh, there's all kinds of forbidden foods. I don't uh, drain the blood out of the out of the meat. I'm, I'm I'm ready for going to the beach party and stuff like that. Shrimp's probably my favorite meal and so on. But how to justify that to a religious person is impossible. So because of these uh, strict purity regulations, so you can talk uh, endlessly, but you'll never be able to change these things as such. Now, you have to, this is still today. So in Paul's time, you say, well, why didn't they accept Paul? You know, it's reasonable. Well, it isn't really reasonable. It seems reasonable, it's pseudo-reasonable, but it's not. He twists scripture, he does all kinds of things, which I can show you. Why, uh, why wouldn't they accept him? I like it. If you're in Ireland, or if you're in um, if you're in um, uh, Togo, or if you're in Tahiti, you have no problem with Paul. He's not changing any of the regulations that you're involved in. So why would you have any hostility towards him? But if you're in Palestine, you can have huge hostility to him because he actually thinks that he can change the tradition of the ancestors. You say, well, that's Jesus. No, no, I don't think it is. I think Jesus, Paul, Jesus becomes a mouthpiece for Pauline teaching in the scripture. Most people don't know that the scripture is involved in polemics. You say, oh, no, that's history. That's history. Well, we can argue with some other time, not in this class yet, whether that's history. But forget whether we think it's history or not. Paul we know because he's got writings and we can read what he says. And we know exactly what he was up to through his, through his uh, writings. And basically he says, for me, uh, all things are lawful. Eat all the food in the butcher shop. Do not make problems about conscience. I can give you 50 quotes from Paul. The law brings death. Uh, therefore, don't take the law upon yourself. Well, I mean, if you're a practitioner of Mosaic law, you're going to get very upset by such a such kind of uh, in Palestine. I mean, it's like going to an Al-Qaeda member and saying Muhammad is a, uh, is a swine. I mean, an uh, Al-Qaeda person is going to try to lop your head off. So, um, you know, you have to understand what this hostility is about. So here we're getting the reason for it. These Maccabee books lay down the situation in Palestine in the 2nd century BC. The Pauline position, two centuries later, it's going to be exactly the opposite of these books. Now these people will fight for 200 years to keep these customs. They will die. There will be endless bloodshed. There will be endless martyrs. There will be endless losses. Whole cities will be destroyed. And then you expect them just to cave in because one teacher comes with some visions that he claims to have had. It's just an impossibility, and I don't understand how people even think that that could ever have happened. It never could happen. That's why Christianity is very strong in the Western countries. But once you get into the Middle East, except for the Christians that came back with the Crusades, once you get into Palestine and then into the Muslim countries, there's no strength there at all. Because of the reasons I'm telling you about. So it can go in 
cultures that don't have this attachment or who are not familiar with what these issues are. And you will then become attached because your ancestors and your forebears were attached, and that's part of your culture. And you love your ancestors, and you love your forebears, and you love what was, everyone loves what they are and who they come from. That's normal. So in the West, it could go. But it can't go in the Middle East. And it never did. The Crusades brought some back in the Middle East. But other than that, it never went. And when the opportunity came, Islam came. And Islam is more like Mosaic Judaism than it is like Christianity. I mean, Islam is simply mosaic or Judaism, if you want to call it, cosmopolitanized. It just lessens it a bit. But most of the regulations, a lot of them are there. So for instance, you go down the street in one of these uh, uh, Arab areas, you'll come to a place called Halal Meats. How many have seen that? Halal Meats? How many have seen H-A-L-E-L? -E you never seen these delicatessens, uh, Middle Eastern delicatessens? They have a big sign out. Halal, it means permitted meats. It's exactly the same as kosher meat for Jews. Plus Muslims don't eat pork. They circumcise themselves. The whole deal. They just lighted up a few areas. And, uh, uh, but other than that, they have a huge legal paraphernalia. It's not based on purity so much, but uh, because it's a newer product of this thing. But it's a throwback. You know, Christianity came through there and then Islam wiped it out in these areas because the people were already used to this previous cultural attachment. Now, that's a simple way of putting it. So when you're reading the Maccabee books, which is my point here, and their struggle against Hellenization, that defines the period here. It defines the period with the Greeks. It's going to define the period with the Romans. It's going to be the whole reason why the temple is destroyed. It's going to be the reason why the Jews don't to this day, except Christianity. It's going to be the reason why Paul has troubles. It's going to be the reason why uh, Jesus is presented as having troubles, though I don't think he did. I think he was executed, if we can his make correct historical uh, um, evaluation of him. I think he was executed as a revolutionary, which is what the crucifixion was, if I told you. So this struggle with Hellenization is the key to our period. And it's hard for people who never thought about that to appreciate that, but you will now. So, here we are, the first description of the, it's not very inspiring, I admit, but it's an interesting book. The first description of the struggle with Hellenization. So, the background brings us down to Antiochus Epiphanes, and we already did this, how many people went astray uh, following the Greek way, that's in line 10 and 11 of Maccabees 1. Chapter 1, and some backsliders, renegades, we may not have the same translation here, who led many people astray. And in the scrolls, that's going to be a favorite um, description of the liar who denies the law in the midst of the whole community. Who is going to be called the liar <coughs> who says the law is not binding. And uh, it, basically, it will be that he led many astray. And the Damascus document will say that. Now we have to know this stuff. The Damascus document, the key Dead Sea Scroll uh, piece of uh, literature, will say, He led many astray in a trackless waste with no boundary markers. Leading astray in a trackless waste is um, a euphemism for not observing the Mosaic law. And um, we'll see in the Damascus document that they have a huge attachment to the Torah, the Mosaic law, whatever you choose to refer to it as. And they don't only have a huge atta attachment, they want to uh, reinforce it and even make it more, um, more hard and fast, that your attachment to it has to be, you know, totally, for instance, the New Testament in, uh, in English is a translation of the Greek, the New Covenant. It's a passage uh, from Jeremiah the prophet. 
think it's something like I'll put a new heart and a new covenant in them or something like that effect. I don't know the exact passage. So this um, this new covenant, this new testament, this new covenant in the Damascus document is one of the principal under, uh, ideas that are going to be presented. And the new the new covenant in the land of Damascus, which God will re-erect there because of the pollution of the country as it presently stands, with all this Roman probably and Greek corruption, is going to be a, um, as it said, to separate the holy things according to their precise specifications. To separate the holy things, in other words, to raise up the holy things and keep them totally pure in their exact regulation and ordinance, and not the opposite. Now in the New Testament, the new, the new covenant is going to be in the blood of Christ. Now I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings here, don't get angry at me. But that's a totally pagan idea. There's no Jewish or Mosaic or Palestinian idea of the blood of any being that you drink. That only, and in fact, the blood of the temple was poured away. It was considered life blood, if you know the Noah, the Noah, uh, the Noah episode of Noah, was given the commandments that he could eat, consume the, the, the flesh of the animal as long as he didn't touch the blood because the life of the animal was in the blood and that was considered equivalent to manslaughter that you were killing by consuming blood. Now the Dead Sea Scrolls are going to have a horror of consuming blood. And even in the book of Acts, if we ever get to it and uh, refer to it sometimes, when James meets Paul and gives his instructions to overseas communities in Acts 15, and Acts has got a very friendly book to Palestinian thought. One of the one of the uh, ordinances or uh, prohibitions or regulations that James puts upon Paul, according to Acts, whether we agree with it or not, I don't know. In order to teach what he was teaching in non-Jewish areas or overseas among so-called Gentiles, was stay away from things sacrificed to idols strangled things, meaning carrion, fornication, and blood. That is no consummation of blood. That was a like sine qua non. That was just impossible. So when you get someone saying the new covenant is the consumption of blood, even symbolically, that's not a Palestinian idea. Those are from Greek mystery religions, Osiris, Isis, Mithra, that was all part of the secret initiation ceremonies that you had in these, uh, in these uh, so-called mystery cults. And uh, you have to understand that that is totally new and Hellenistic. It is, and that's why I'm talking about this. I'm not condemning it. It's fine if you want to do it. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I eat blood, so I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not telling anyone not to eat blood. But the point of the matter is that you have to be fair. You have to understand it's not Palestinian. You say, yeah, it's a new thing. What? It's a new thing in that some people want to Hellenize this part of the world. And Jesus, the figure through whom they're doing this Hellenization process, if you want to call it a Romanization by this time, uh, is presented as, uh, as um, uh, not only allowing, but making this a blessed sacrament, if you want. Well, if, yeah, if, if that's a sacrament, and that was part of it then, his closest associates never knew it. Because his closest associates forbid the consumption of blood, even after his death. So, so they don't know it. So something is wrong somewhere. And the issue is, I think, the people who are trying to Hellenize versus the people who are not willing to Hellenize. So here we have the book against Hellenization and the liar in the Dead Sea Scrolls leading many people astray and the new covenant in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls being the erecting of the holy things according to their precise specifications. Now, these people, the renegades, the backsliders, page 11, who has a, a, that there emerged from Israel a set of what? I have renegades who led many people astray. Anyone have a different one? What do you have in your book? I don't have uh, verses in this. Oh, well. Well, after it says the Antiochus Epiphanes, the 37th year of the kingdom of the Greeks, what's the next uh, sentence after that? 
I have a Bible that doesn't have uh, verses. You, you really should get one that does have verses. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're, really, you're really in serious trouble with that one. <laughs> Who's got another translation? Anyone have another translation? Such renegades? I am one, uh, one twelve, I think. Eleven, 11 or twelve. The, yeah, between eleven and twelve. Anyone have any other? What do you have? It says in those days there appeared in Israel men who were breakers of the law. Okay, that's that's puts it bluntly. <laughs> uh, huh? Wicked men. No, uh, that that's not right. I don't think it's more than that. It's people who abandoned, who backslid, who broke the law, or who. Uh, who uh, were backsliders, who had previously had the law, but uh, were abandoning, okay? That could be conceived of as wicked, but that's too, too, uh, too general, I think. I don't think that's what's being said. Anyway, they said, come on, let us reach an understanding with the nations, the uh, Gentiles, the pagans, the, I don't know what you have there uh, to describe who the Greeks are. They call pagans or Gentiles or uh, nations, yeah. heathen. <laughs> Huh? Gentiles. Gentiles is the place where heathen, pagan. <laughs> There's no Hebrew word for heathen, pagan. It's not a very rich language. And if you look at the Greek often, it's ethnon, where we get the word ethnic from, peoples. Uh, the other Hebrew, uh, uh, in, uh, that's a Greek word, ethnon. Um, this is uh, a Greek book here, because we don't have a Hebrew version of it. We only have a Greek, uh, similar languages from this book. Um, there's two Hebrew words for this, peoples and uh, amim and goyim. Goyim we hear a lot about. Uh, uh, goyim was really nations, amim was peoples. And Gentiles is a general word for both, but particularly I think peoples. Anyway, forget that. So they lead many people astray. Come, they said, let us reach understanding with the nations, Gentiles around us, because since we have separated ourselves, many misfortunes have undertaken, have overtaken us. And so they started observing these sort of idolatrous, if you like, observances from the point of view of the author. Now, does this book have a point of view? Oh, definitely, definitely. So every book has a point of view. There's no book that you can read. Humans have written them. Wherever, as Bill O'Reilly says, wherever humans are, they're spin. So, uh, and even he spins constantly. So, no spin zone doesn't exist. <laughs> and he says it's a new word, spin, but the uh, point of view, uh, you know, an agenda and attitude. Uh, so, there's that mixing with the non Jewish peoples who do not have a law and are not observing holiness regulations. Is that clear? Is not good. And keeping the law of the ancestors, Moses, is the admirable thing. Does that, no, anyone disagree with that? That's the spin. Now, if I were Paul, I wouldn't like this book. Therefore, why is it in a Christian Bible? We already discussed that a bit, but basically the point is that the rabbis who put the Jewish Bible together didn't like this book either. <laughs> because it was too warlike, revolutionary, and they, they, they blamed all the trouble against the war against the Romans on attitudes like this, too warlike, too resistant. Not subtle enough, not, um, not accommodating enough to get through the situation. Maybe they were right. Uh, but uh, you see, Jews are very...